Hi everyone, welcome to our webinar today. The topic for this webinar is One Year In, Energy Storage Proves Its Worth in Sterling Mass. This webinar is a presentation of the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, also known as STAP. The webinar is being presented by uh, the Clean Energy States Alliance and uh, CISA and it's uh, being supported by the U.S. Department of Energy, Office of Electricity, and Sandia National Labs. We have a couple of excellent speakers with us on the line uh, who will be presenting in just a moment. We also have with us our host for this webinar, who is Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd is a project director here at CESA. And before I pass it over to them, I'd like to just go over a few quick housekeeping notes. All of our attendees for this webinar are in listen-only mode. You have a couple of options to join the audio portion of the webinar. You can either call in using a telephone or you can connect using your computer mic and speakers. Um, if you would like to minimize or expand your webinar console, you can do that by clicking on the little orange arrow that you see circled here. A very important note, we ask that you please submit your questions as you think of them throughout the webinar by typing them into the question box on the webinar console and hitting send. And uh, we will get to as many questions as we can. So please uh, type your questions in when you think of it. Don't wait until the end. Um, we will try to save about 15, 20 minutes for a Q&A. And a final note, uh, this webinar is being recorded. We will send you an email with a copy of the webinar recording and a link to the PDF of webinar slides within about uh, 48 hours, probably this afternoon. And uh, you'll also be able to find all of our webinar materials on our website at cisa.org backslash webinars. So with that, I would like to pass this over to our host for today's webinar, Todd Olinsky-Paul. Todd? Okay, thanks very much and welcome everybody to this STAP webinar, uh, supported and uh, really produced in this case uh, by DOE Office of Electricity and Sandia National Laboratories. And uh, it's really um, a special occasion because it's really the uh, almost the one year, I mean, a little past the one year anniversary of the Sterling Energy Storage Project. And so we get to uh, get back together with folks that uh, were partners in making this project happen and look at the operations and the economics of the first year since commissioning. So uh, welcome to everybody. I want to do a brief introduction on uh, CISA and STAP, and then I'll introduce the panelists. So Clean Energy States Alliance, or CISA, is a uh, nonprofit. Uh, we're located in Vermont. We're celebrating 15 years uh, this year. Well, I guess uh, technically last year. Um, and as you can see, we have quite a few state energy agency members, um, and we work with all these state energy agencies in uh, helping them to refine and develop and, and run programs and policies related to clean energy of all types. Uh, the Energy Storage Technology Advancement Partnership, or STAP, is a specific uh, project within CESA that we conduct under uh, an arrangement uh, contract with Sandia National Laboratories. It is funded by US DOE Office of Electricity. And the STAP program has several key activities, uh, one of which is to do webinars uh, such as this one and also uh, other types of information uh, sharing, knowledge sharing through conferences, through uh, reports and white papers and case studies and the like. Uh, we also facilitate public-private partnerships at the state level t for energy storage demonstration project development and deployment. And we're going to be talking about one such project today. And then thirdly, we support state energy storage policymaking and program development efforts with technical assistance. And we will touch on that today as well. 
And we want to thank Dr. Emery Shook of the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Electricity and Dan Borneo of Sandia National Laboratories uh, for uh, supporting this project. And without them, uh, there would be no STEP project. So uh, the, as, the, as you know, the topic of the webinar today is the Sterling Massachusetts Energy Storage Project, uh, which was commissioned in December of 2016. So it's uh, had its one year anniversary just a couple months ago. We will be reviewing the particularly the economics of the project because it's a very important demonstration of certain uh, applications for energy storage and particularly energy storage at <coughs> utilities. And this is a uh, the Sterling uh, Municip Municipal Utility is the owner of the project. And we have Sean Hamilton here uh, from that utility with us today. Uh, so let me do brief introductions. We were supposed to have Dr. Emery Juk with us today. Unfortunately, he was unable to make it. He's asked me to say a few words on his behalf, which I'll do once we begin the presentations. But he is Director of Energy Storage Research at the U.S. DOE Office of Electricity. Uh, he's served as Director at DOE OE uh, Electrical Energy Storage Research Program for the past decade, supporting the development of a wide portfolio of storage technologies for a broad spectrum of applications. He's also an internationally recognized expert on energy storage technology. Also joining us today is Dr. Ray Byrne, a distinguished member of the technical staff at Sandia National Laboratories. Uh, Ray serves as team lead of the Equitable Regulatory Environment Thrust Area of the Sandia Energy Storage Program. We'll also be hearing from Sean Hamilton, General Manager of the Sterling Municipal Light Department. Sean currently serves on the Northeast Public Power Association Board of Directors, the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company Board of Directors, and he's past president of the Municipal Electric Association of Massachusetts and has 37 years in the public power industry. Uh, also joining us not to present, but to contribute to questions and discussion after the presentations is Dan Borneo, Engineering Program Project Lead and Principal Member of Technical Staff at Sandia National Laboratories. Dan serves as the Principal Investigator and Project Team Leader for the Department of Energy Office of Electricity Electrical Energy Storage Systems projects program at Sandia. He has 35 years of experience in the electrical power industry. So a lot of collective experience here and um, I'm going to begin uh, the presentations by uh, presenting Dr. Zhuk's slides. Unfortunately, as I said, he couldn't be with us today, but he did send me a few notes, uh, comments that he would like to me to make in his behalf, starting with his apologies for not being able to make it. But he did want to say that he is quite proud of this federal state uh, municipal collaboration. Uh, the project went from groundbreaking to operational in three months, which is one of the advantages, of course, of energy storage. It's very fast to deploy. Uh, and in the very first month, in fact, I think a day after commissioning, uh, the project was able to be deployed to capture the monthly transmission peak in December of 20, let's see, 2016. And you can see on the screen here, <clears throat> the lower left-hand corner, uh, that dramatic drop uh, on the right side of the slide is where the batteries brought down that peak and that one deployment for about two hours was worth over $200,000. Uh, I'm sorry, worth over $16,000, which if you multiply that by 12 months in a year would equate to about $200,000 a year in savings. Um, Emory also wanted me to mention that the first year's data bears out the analysis that Ray conducted, which he'll be speaking about uh, next, with a return of nearly $400,000 in total for the first year of operations. Along with the economic success of this project, there have been several other notable uh, 
uh, advances and, and awards. Um, <clears throat> one of the advances associated with the project is this energy storage procurement guidance document from municipalities, <clears throat> excuse me, which was produced by Sandia. Um, in the process of working with Sterling to uh, develop the project, Sandia uh, and CISA realized that there really isn't any kind of good guidance out there uh, for municipalities to use in procuring energy storage systems. And so this document was created and is available now for use by anybody. It's uh, available on the Sandia website. Uh, also, the Sterling project has received a number of awards, uh, including the 2017 GTM Grid Edge Award, and has uh, hosted a number of visitors, including international visitors from Germany, Denmark, England, Japan, Malaysia, Taiwan, and other places around the world. So it's been uh, quite successful and recognized. And of course, the ultimate uh, goal here is not just to develop a single project, but to prove out the applications and economics that will support follow-on project development by others, and that has also happened in this case. Um, <clears throat> there have been a number of other municipal utilities in Massachusetts that have received grants under uh, Massachusetts grant programs and are now developing similar energy storage projects with similar economic uh, goals uh, and resiliency goals. I should mention that that Massachusetts uh, ACES uh, program, which is just recently awarded $20 million to these other projects, was created with support from Sandia uh, and CISA and um, also that there is a Massachusetts Peak Demand Reduction Grant Program, which was designed specifically for this kind of, of uh, peak demand management, which is demonstrated so well by the Sterling Project. Massachusetts has also adopted a 200 megawatt hour uh, annual, uh, uh, utility energy storage procurement target, and um, MWEC, which is the, uh, I mentioned it earlier, is the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company, is planning to provide centralized dispatch services for a number of the municipal projects that are coming out uh, through the grants I just mentioned. In fact, uh, MWEC has now taken over dispatch of the Sterling Project, which saves uh, money by centralizing those services and uh, improves the economic outcome by uh, applying MOX expertise to the process. And um, we anticipate that they will be offering similar services to other municipalities in the near future that are also installing storage. So all in all, uh, the Sterling project has had a terrific impact and we and, and Emory is quite pleased with the project. So, uh, thanks again, everybody. I will now uh, pass the torch to Dr. Ray Byrne of Sandia to discuss the project economics and uh, his analysis. Thank you, Todd. All right, next slide. All right, today um, I'm just going to spend a little bit of time talking about the potential value streams at Sterling and the analysis we did, and then uh, talk briefly about results. So for potential value streams, we considered energy arbitrage, um, reduction in monthly network load uh, payments, uh, reduction in capacity payments, grid resilience, and then frequency regulation. Next slide. So energy arbitrage is probably the most familiar uh, energy storage application. It's just buy low, sell high. Um, there are different variants. 
Uh, you can buy in the day ahead market and sell in the day ahead market, or you can arbitrage between the day ahead and real time markets, or you can use renewables to provide the inexpensive supply of energy that then you sell in the day ahead market. But uh, one of the key drivers for arbitrage is the efficiency losses in an energy storage system, and you have to overcome those in order to make any kind of uh, profit. So even for an 85% efficient system, uh, the high price has to be about 18% higher than the low price before you even start to break even. Um, and then the two plots here just show typical um, LMPs over the course of a 24-hour period at the Sterling uh, node. Um, the one on the left is uh, kind of your more traditional shape. You have a peak in late afternoon, early evening when folks get home from work. Um, so you would you know, buy the energy uh, at night and then sell during that peak. But depending on the time of year and conditions in the grid, you can also have two peaks. Uh, so the one on the right, uh, there's a peak in the morning hours, and then there's a smaller peak later in the afternoon. Um, when you start having multiple peaks, that becomes more of a forecast challenge. So sometimes it's harder to actually predict when you should buy and sell. Uh, next slide. Uh, monthly network load payments um, is, is a big potential revenue stream for Sterling, and that's because ISO New England employs uh, R&S payments uh, for use of the pool transmission facilities to move electricity into uh, and within, I, within the New England Balancing Authority. So the table shows the, the um, rate for uh, the pool transmission facilities, and one thing to note, uh, the price has steadily gone up from 2007 to 2016. It's gone up almost fourfold. Um, and given the, um, the current pricing from 2016, a two megawatt system would save you about $208,000 per year if you were able to reduce your monthly uh, load peak by two megawatts and hit every month. Uh, a big challenge with this is, uh, is how you actually forecast when those peaks are and, and, and hitting those peaks, but Sterling has been doing an excellent job on, on hitting those peaks. Uh, next slide. Uh, and the next uh, potential revenue stream is the forward capacity market payments. So ISO New England has a forward capacity market, um, and the amount that you uh, have to pay into that is uh, computed using um, a, a somewhat complex formula. Um, but there's a, a capacity clearing price that's set in an auction several years in advance. Um, and then uh, if you reduce your load, in a particular peak hour for a particular year, uh, you can reduce the amount that you have to pay in to pay fund that capacity or port capacity market. So the savings are roughly proportional to the obligation times the load reduction divided by the peak load. Uh, one thing that's a little tricky with this calculation is when ISO New England uh, calculates how much money is going to be in the port capacity market. Uh, they pick a load number, which is often much higher than what the peak load is in the peak hour of the year. So for the example, at the bottom of the page, um, 32 gigawatts was the number used to calculate the amount of money in the forward capacity market. And then your fraction that you save um, by reducing your load uh, is then just the 2,000 kilowatts divided by the actual load um, during that peak hour. So using 2016 data, it comes out to about $102,000 a year, but you'll note in 2017, uh, 2018, and 2019, the price roughly doubles. Uh, and so data is actually available for some future years now, and so it didn't continue to go up rapidly. It's actually kind of stabilized a little bit, um, but $200,000 a year would be expected um, for 2017 data. Next slide. Uh, grid resilience was the primary motivation for this um, for this application, uh, and that was to bring uh, backup power to first responders, the police and the dispatch center. Um, typically, you calculate value of lost load to look at this benefit, and there are two different ways to come up with that number. One is uh, market prices, and the other is surveys, and surveys are, are probably more prevalent. Um, we relied on some data from a uh, Lawrence Berkeley report um, that looked at um, public administration, small, commercial, and industrial, uh, but it, it came out to about $40,000 per year for, um, for one big outage. But that likely underestimates the value to sterling, uh, and we think this is an area for further research, is better valuing uh, the, the grid resilience benefit for first responders. 
because even if you can just save one life by having uh, power during a hurricane or a storm, uh, it can have a pretty significant savings. Uh, next slide. Um, frequency regulation is one of the more popular energy storage um, applications. It, it wasn't really of interest to, I, to uh, Sterling. Uh, they did not plan to do frequency regulation and are not doing frequency regulation, but we looked at it just to be complete in our analysis. And so that's just uh, the second by second adjustment in output power to maintain grid frequency. Um, there are different market impl implementations. Uh, some markets have a separate regulation up and regulation down signal, and examples include CalISO and ERCOT. Then um, other markets have a, assume a bidirectional capability, and that would be like ISO New England, PGM, and MISO. Uh, so if you have a bidirectional capability, you have to be able to provide power or sync power from the grid. And you're typically sent a signal every two to four seconds that you have to follow. Um, per quarter 755, pay for performance. Uh, forced uh, ISOs to uh, incorporate some kind of performance score and mileage payments. Um, and then some ISOs like PJM have a fast AGC signal uh, for fast devices like energy storage. Uh, next slide. So for the analysis, uh, we looked at several years of historical data and ran an optimization using perfect foresight, which assumed you knew the future. And that gives you the best possible number that you can expect. Um, so these are the tables for arbitrage, considering a four megawatt hour system. Um, the top uh, shows different power ratings, 0.25 megawatts all the way up to two megawatts. Uh, and the column on the right that's highlighted, that's the um, size of the, uh, roughly the size of the Sterling system. So one thing you'll notice here, uh, there's a diminishing return for the power rating. Um, if you look at a one megawatt system, for 2015, it's maybe $35,000 in potential revenue, uh, which uh, is, is if you then look at the two megawatt uh, column, it's not double. So if you double the uh, power rating, keeping the energy rating the same, you don't double the potential rev revenue. So uh, there, there's a limiting, um, limiting factor there. Next slide. So this table shows arbitrage plus frequency regulation. Um, frequency regulation is typically much more profitable than arbitrage, uh, usually by a factor of three. Uh, and so the numbers here are much bigger in the right-hand column. Um, another thing to note too is if you go from a one megawatt system to a two megawatt system, uh, you'll roughly double uh, your potential income. And this is just because you can uh, participate uh, with at a higher level in, in the frequency regulation market. Uh, next slide. And then uh, this last uh, table puts everything together, arbitrage, regulation, uh, regional network services, and forward capacity market uh, using historical data. And so, uh, you know, between 2012 and 2015, uh, the revenue potential was pretty significant, especially in 2014 and 2015, uh, you were looking at maybe $680,000 of, of total potential revenue uh, for a size system, uh, two megawatt, four megawatt hour in Sterling. Uh, next slide. So this is just a, a, a chart that shows one week of uh, typical optimization results. Um, and so the quantity is QD, that's the discharge quantity. Uh, QC is the charge quantity in red. Uh, QREG is the amount uh, bid into the frequency regulation market. And then the bottom chart, SOC, is just state of charge. So since frequency regulation provides the most revenue, uh, the optimal policy is just to hang out at 50% state of charge most of the time and then do frequency regulation all the time. But this particular week has a, has a peak hour in it. So uh, if you knew that in advance, you would charge up to 100% state of charge, um, which is what happens. And then you just discharge during the peak hour and, and capture that benefit as well. And then go back to doing frequency regulation. Uh, next slide. And this is just a closer look of, of what happens during that peak hour. Um, and, and so in this particular case, uh, the, the peak for the forward capacity market is um, different than the um, different hour than the R and S peak that are right next to each other. So you, you charge up to 100% state of charge right before those two hours happen, and then you discharge to capture both peaks. Uh, and then after that, you get back to 50% state of charge and start doing uh, frequency regulation again. Uh, next slide. 
So this just shows more details on the grid resilience benefit. Um, and these were calculated from um, data in a Lawrence Berkeley report uh, that was uh, comes from surveys. And so uh, since we're using just public administration, which is a general category uh, for a four megawatt hour system, uh, you can provide power to their um, critical loads for about 16 days. So if you had an outage that occurred that long, uh, it would be about $163,000 benefit. Um, but like I said, this, this really probably underestimates the true value. And, and this is unfortunate because a lot of reasons that these projects are, are happening is for grid resilience. And, and, and often that benefit isn't uh, properly accounted for. Uh, next slide. So in summary, um, arbitrage is more synergistic with the peak shaving applications for the forward capacity market and regional network services. And those are the three applications that Sterling has chosen to, uh, to focus on. Um, and, and there are significant savings from the forward capacity market, RNS savings and frequency regulation. Uh, if you'd like any more information, we do have a, a report on this analysis. It's available from the IEEE website, or you can also get it from the Sandia website and the link is at the bottom of the slide. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Sean, who can tell you about how things have actually been going uh, with the deployed system. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you, Ray. Um, thank you for that great presentation. Um, there we are. Get ready to come up here. OK, the, the Sterling project, and there's a picture of it right in front of you. But that's, as um, Todd mentioned earlier, it's, it's had a lot of visitors. Probably the first question is what's it look like and how much space does it take up? And we show this slide a lot to, to show what it is. That's a that's a 53 foot trailer by nine feet in dimensions, and the, the, the white box in front of the trailer is actually the, the inverter. It's a two megawatt inverter, which limits your output and input. And then beyond that, there's two transformers. It's the two transformers ahead of that. The, the main one is that the 2500 is, is for the main power supply coming into charge and also to to put into the system. But to the right of that, it's very difficult to see. There's a smaller transformer where we measure the um, actually the HVAC load and the actual operation cost of the unit uh, to make sure we're capturing all the cost that it takes to run this. Uh, that was one surprise we did see in the project that probably hasn't been said enough is the project actually cost about a quarter of what we expected to to, op to cost to operate, um, having a 10 ton unit on top of there running um, throughout the summer. And uh, it's really worked out very well. Um, the save on, on the, the cost. This next slide is a combination of, of some of the some of the alerts uh, we use, and I predict when we're going to run, when we're going to charge. Uh, we're in constant communication, as, as Todd mentioned earlier. The Emwick, uh, the Massachusetts Municipal Wholesale Electric Company, um, we've partnered with them. They actually currently operate the Berkshire Wind Project and the Stony Brook. Uh, project out, out in Ludlow. So they've got around the clock uh, a knock that actually is paying attention to the market, paying attention to what's going on. Uh, working with them with these alerts has proved very successful to us. Um, you'll see later on the slides that we started out, uh, we actually missed a couple of the peaks, uh, primarily because uh, one thing was a learning curve on when batteries are charging, that you're actually going to not be available uh, while they balance. Uh, that was a learning curve. And also just predicting when these peaks take place. Uh, we learn by working with them and then watching the market and predictability of the future. You can see the top right corner when it takes place in June, the historical peak. It's, it's quite a variation of when that actually happens, but based on their history and the markets and the weather and our load and everything seems to be going on, we, we've got a pretty good system going forward. They notify us in the morning. Uh, we have any problems, we go back to them. We'll talk again sometimes mid-afternoon during some major peaking days. Uh, communication between three of us, so someone's always um, staying in touch with them. And you'll see in the seven-day forecast, this kind of gives us a ready, ready go. Uh, what days we figure we're going to pay more attention than others. Uh, the weather changes, load changes, things happen, so it's an everyday thing. But this, this, this kind of gives us an indicator moving forward. Uh, the, the column on the bottom left is actually the graph for the, the peak day, which was 6:13 of, of last year. You can see how that, that looked um, in the curve of the load. To the right of that, it shows you the alert ratings and, and how it explains each one and how they, you know, how they are rated, um, uh, more or less how do we act on them. You know, number one, it says just take no action, nothing needed. Right down number five is, you know, you better be paying attention because it's, it's more than likely something's going to happen today. 
Uh, this has proved very beneficial to us, and I think you know, we've pretty much taken over the operation and the dispatching of this um, for a number of reasons, primarily because during the night, even when the LMPs go negative, the arbitrage that Ray talked about earlier, there's some, there's some negative opportunities to charge when the LMPs are negative, and that, that's proven the last few months to be very valuable to us. Looking at that peak data I just showed you earlier, this this was an actual uh, this was an actual look at the sterling load that day, and you can see where it was up to about 10.5 at, at, at two o'clock, and a little after two. And at that point, we began shedding. Th this shows a lot of shedding, but this isn't just the batteries. I just want to let everybody know that this also includes we have a demand response program with some large customers. We have the water department. We have a uh, local control with meters. That actually, people have a rate that allows us to control. It's about 120 customers. We can shut their meters off. They control pool pumps, water heaters, things like that that give us an extra load. This, What you're seeing here is a combination of all of those, but a majority of that is, is the batteries and what they look like throughout that period. And you can see even after we started the load shedding, the uh, load started to go right back up again and then come back down. and where that SMLD load is, that's where we were at the at the peaking hour. Um, so we're substantially lower than where we wanted to be. Uh, reflect on what Ray, you know, the value Ray said is how much can you shed during that, that one hour period. Uh, the value of this gets carried into 2018. That's a, but it, it was quite a substantial savings to our rate payers looking into 2018. It sets the obligation for uh, for the for the following year. This this is the one that uh, Todd mentioned earlier about the construction period. I think that's that's one of the highlights of this project. Uh, working with uh, the Massachusetts Department of Energy Resources, Judith Judson, and, and Dr. Emery Juk and Department of Energy, as well as CND and CISA. I mean, the collaboration between all of us and the, the town of Sterling made this project incredibly uh, successful because of the this project was shovel in the ground October 12th and, and operating 12-16. What it doesn't have in the middle of that, you had Thanksgiving, you had Veterans Day, you had you know, weekends, and our guys work four 10-hour days. So it's actually 33 working days from the day we put the first shovel in the ground till the, till the night we operated, um, this night right here. And, and that, that night, the particular weather, we had, a, I think it was like two below with a wind chill. The wind chill was close to uh, 20, 20 below, I believe they said. So we were... Uh, we knew we were pretty confident that it was going to be one of those nights that the peak would be available, and we we're very fortunate to hit it. You can see where we were at that particular time. So that, that's a value to our rate payers that have proved out. Um, some of the other things that you know, we've talked about, what we didn't talk about through, through Ray's presentation or mine, is, is the intermittent resources. Um, we've had uh, we have three and a half megawatts of solar in our system, so 13.4 mega peak all-time peak load, and you can see what happens to that during a loss of that solar during a thunderstorm that we go right into the, the high peer, um, high high cost areas at 12,000 and at that time that the LMPs were close to $500 a megawatt or 50 cents a kilowatt hour when you're selling them for about 12 and a half cents that's not a good business model for do very for very long um, so this this allows us to ride through areas like that we see thunderstorms coming now we know in the future we haven't done this yet we haven't had to we know we can turn these on and just ride through these thunderstorms and without having an adverse effect on the system or, or our market analysis of when we purchase power. These were some of the ideas we were looking at when we originally looked at batteries uh, started back in 2012, 2013. And this came along to, to help us prove the point. Some of the cost to install, there's varied numbers going out there because we, we did a lot of work at the same time. We, we built a resiliency um, circuit to the police and fire station, which was right outside our substation. We had the engineering, we had to do um, multiple things to make sure our system, our load, uh, the, the capacity, and, you know, we could handle all the things we needed to do. So it's quite a bit of work in, in the engineering side of that, designing the plans, designing the pads, designing the interconnect, um, all went into that. So that was done with Scott Reynolds, uh, our engineer on the project. He did a great job. Uh, taking care of the project itself, while at the same time we had uh, PLM looking at our substation to make sure that you know, that work could be, that, you know, it could work well with our substation, um, along with the feasibility study. Uh, these, these things were uh, really important to start the project to make sure we didn't have any adverse effects on the system. And what we did begin to do, and it's, it's not part of this this cost here, but we did 
change out our relay panels. Uh, it says upgrade, but it's actually replacement. Uh, we replaced the analog panels with uh, new solid state, uh, which allows us better monitoring, better uh, operation of our system. So this, these are costs that, that kind of fell over, but there was something that had to be done. Uh, the BESS with the inverter, that's, that's the price you see there now. Um, but that's varied because, the, the, I, I'll be honest with you, I'm not sure if that's the correct price because we did some work because we actually picked up some cost of doing some installations on some cables and things that originally were with the vendor. But in the end, because it's what we do, we're a utility, uh, we worked out worked it out with them for us to take it over. And it worked very well with NEC to, to get the, the thing installed. Uh, it was just Sterling Light and NEC in the project. There's no middle, middle man. So a lot of the things that need to get worked on were done done with just us two. Uh, if you look at the other equipment, you're looking at the uh, the reclosers, the, the pads, the, the transformers, the um, poles, wires, cables, conduits. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that went into that to, to get the, the site ready for the for the project itself. Um, labor is the crew, and that's that's multiple from getting the site ready to pulling the cables to doing the uh, high line work, the interconnect work, the metering work, a lot of that. Uh, legal legal is kind of interesting on this because um, there's really no footprints to follow. I mean, the RFP that they talked about earlier that Sandia uh, worked on, you know, that that was part. Of, we worked with them on that RFP to get that out there, and you know, it's all this stuff was new. There wasn't a lot of stuff to follow. So legal was developing a contract with this, and the warranties that were included in that it took a little longer probably than we expected. Um, this one was a testing the commissioning. You can see that, that the price there. That's a lot of the final commissioning to get this online, shutting down the, we actually shut down the police station one day and let the batteries take over. Uh, I had some learning curves in there about the program of the, of the reclosers, but it was good to find out all this stuff, but we did officially run it off of the batteries for a while. And the other stuff was just everyone's uh, time and energy putting into this thing. So you see the prices right there. Um, the value, I, real, I, won't, I won't go over this too much. Uh, Ray, Ray has captured a lot of this. Uh, the one thing I will point out is there's only 38 round trip operations of this thing throughout 2017. And that was done specifically because uh, we, we weren't looking at frequency regulation. Uh, we didn't want to keep it the 50% uh, state of charge. We'd rather have a full charge or ready charge uh, for us. And that worked out uh, worked out rather well for us. So I won't go a lot to the value. I think Ray's pretty much covered that. He did a great job before the project started giving us these numbers to, to bring forward. There's again those numbers of arbitrage. Uh, you know, these, these have been talked about, so I won't. I'll, I'll, I'll go through these. A resiliency. I think this is you know the same thing that like Ray just said, uh, up to 12 days. Uh, you know, it's funny when in the discussions with the police station, the police chief and the fire chief about these things. You know, you, you talk about all the things that resiliency and the value to it. And I think the biggest value everyone mentioned was someone would have a place to go charge their phone. That was the Number one thing that everyone had, had agreed to that as long as you have a place that people can charge their phone and call out and let people know they're okay, I think that was that was pretty uh, pretty important to everyone. Um, this is just some some quick bragging rights uh, that for this year that's what the project did for us. This is before we added another megawatt, two megawatt hours of of uh, megawatt of solar and then two megawatt hours of storage. Um, that'll be even go, that number will go even higher. The SEPA numbers right here with the new project will probably put us up in this range, one one seven five somewhere in that range. So we're actually moving from here up to here uh, to number below number two. Um, so that'll be kind of interesting to see where that number finally falls. Uh, this is the new project that Todd mentioned. It's a one megawatt community solar with one megawatt, two megawatts of battery storage. This is the strictly charging the batteries with the solar. Darren, if you follow that, you're well aware of the duck curve and the belly of the duck. Uh, that's the area we want to capture with the, with the batteries now and then um, use that to, to shift low cost. Your to yeah. Yeah. And, uh, on that. Allow residents to access solar, otherwise it's unavailable. And the peak shade benefits we, we can share with all the ratepayers. Program is still being worked on. We expect to roll it out um, in April. We just got to find some some things we want to do with this. I'm excited about that project. I, I've got to go back to that project just a minute for the purposes of, of you know this project is the one thing I should make clear on this is this was done because of the benefits of the other one. We saw very early in the other project how, how valuable these these value streams to us and we're to the ratepayers and you know with the work of of, of Emory and, and um, DOER and Sandia, you know, it, this this 
project came about because of the success of that first project. This project doesn't happen without the success of that first project, and we're very fortunate to have them as a team member to help us with this project. So I, I just want to make sure that was noted that because of that success, we, we get to move forward again. And here's the low profile you see. This is why it talks about the charging down and down. The, you know, the, the belly of the uh, back will be down here charging the batteries and then up at the top right hand corner you'll see where the discharge points would be and this would be a normal peak summer day or what the load would look like you can see on top of that the load profile you know if it's raining or overcast that day that's that's what happens so a special thanks these are the team just to show you what a team it takes a team to do all this and, and to get the project like this going so i want to thank all the members that are on this list here and uh we're very fortunate to have the team work with us that we have with, uh, again, DOE, DOER, uh, CISA, and, and the others that were in the Bar Foundation and others that helped us in this project. So I want to send a special thank you to all of them. Or if any of those are listening, thank you. And I'll, I'll turn that over to Todd. Okay, thanks very much, Sean and Ray, for your presentations. And again, I apologize to our listeners for the technical difficulties earlier on. Uh, we do have a number of good questions queued up, and so we'll jump on into those. Uh, first one is a sort of general question. Um, after a year of operations, what lessons learned would uh, you share with others considering similar projects? And Sean, I guess that's really to you. I think the, the main lesson learned was on the recloser, that they're designed to go look in one direction, where when you're putting up a battery system, it's got to look both ways to actually charge and discharge. Uh, that was one of our main uh, main lessons learned. Uh, I think the other thing was the, the peaks. The peaks are not what we thought they were. When you're uh, Sometimes they're not as normal as you think they are. They, they happen at unusual times, unusual periods. So I tell people it's like taking care of a baby. you got to kind of watch it 24 hours and be aware of what's going on around your surroundings. Those are my two major points. Okay. Uh, another question. Were there any technical issues with the batteries, and did the system operate as planned? The system operated well as planned. There was no technical issues whatsoever. Uh, again, the only technical issue was on that recloser, at the, but that was during the resiliency test when we shut down the um, police station. They were on generator at the time looking for our batteries, so we got the batteries up and running and, and over to them. Uh, and then they started running off the batteries, but it was just a recloser, the programming of the recloser, which was lessons learned to all of us. Even the recloser manufacturer hadn't, hadn't assumed this type of operation, so it's unusual. Okay. Uh, another question, how, how has battery fade played out, and has it faded slower or faster than anticipated? And you might want to, uh, in answering this question, you might want to uh, mention the sort of built-in um, uh, extra capacity that the uh, battery vendor provided at the beginning of the project. Yeah, good point, Todd. Uh, this battery, this we went out to for the RFP on this project. It was a two megawatt, three megawatt hour uh, RFP. The vendor provided us two megawatts, three point nine megawatt hours, so that at the end of the five year warranty, it could meet the three year uh, megawatt hour that we required. Uh, we're very surprised. Like I said earlier, we've only run this 38 times round trip. The efficiency is what we expected. The capacity is still right at the very top because we're running it so little. Um, and that's part of our plan and why we are shading away from frequency regulations to keep the batteries uh, running infrequently, but just keep them charged properly. So, Yeah, and that actually, um, the decisions that you're making really reflect the value of energy storage being more in capacity services than in energy services. I'm assuming that um, pretty much everything you're doing, with, uh, well, with maybe the exception of, of arbitrage, is is a sort of a capacity service or a form of capacity service. Is that right, or is that how you think about it? That's correct. We're, we're, we're Capacity is the number one concern, and the regional network service charge or the monthly peak charge is the, is the second. Arbitrage is, is, is third, and then, we, like I said, we haven't followed frequency regulation. And resiliency is number one. It sits there 2,200 feet from the police station, ready to go whenever we need it. So that's so we're, we're very fortunate the way it worked out. Right. And actually, we have some questions on the resiliency aspect. One is, uh, how long can the storage at 2 megawatt hour, well, I think it's actually 2 megawatt, but almost 4 megawatt hours, if I'm, if I'm not wrong on that. How long can it power the police 
and uh, dispatch? We've estimated up to 12 days based on their, their current load. We have an AMI system, so we're able to monitor their load. Based on their peak load and lo talking with them and say what reductions could take place, you know, sort of the air conditioning turning up a little bit, things you could do for energy conservation, uh, where would you be at for your, your load? Based on what we came up with for projections, it'd be at least up to 12 days. That's, that's straight off the batteries. That's not recharging the batteries in any way, shape, or form. That's just discharging the batteries to the bottom. Right. So assuming that you would get some solar discharge, and I think uh, generally, at least for this part of the world, in other words, for New England, we sort of estimate you get one full day of charge out of every three days conservatively. Um, you know, so, so on average in the winter, you're not expecting to fully charge it necessarily all day at, you know, but, but what do you anticipate that the could you support the, the police station indefinitely, assuming that you, you are able to recharge at a conservative rate over the course of that 12-day uh, period? Would you be able to continually recharge fully? I think you could get a couple a couple of days. Out. It's very difficult to answer because based on what what is the resilient effort, is it a flood, hurricane, tornado, uh, is it a cyber attack? Uh, what's driving it? Uh, it could really have a high impact on whether we can access the solar, uh, you know, if it's a hurricane, I saw what happened in St. Thomas, and that, you know, uh, it probably won't be online. And then the batteries would, because they're not going anywhere. But, um, you know, tornadoes, hurricanes, cyber attack, you know, can, is your communication line still open? Um, it's really hard to say. I would say in a perfect world, I, I expect about a three to four days is what I would think. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know what frequency regulation is worth. And then there's another question on how is frequency regulation monetized? So maybe you could speak to that. Maybe Ray, I don't know who uh, who wants to jump in on that one. Okay. Um, can we go back a few slides on mine? Is there a specific slide number? Um, let's see. So we can go to slide number nine. So this chart just shows a potential revenue from arbitrage and frequency regulation, but since frequency regulation is much more profitable than arbitrage, it's really the revenue for frequency regulation. Um, so this is just uh, for using the uh, information in ISO New England, uh, just publicly available market prices. Uh, you can see for 2015, a two megawatt, four megawatt hour system, potential revenue is about $412,000 a year. Uh, you, you should also notice that, you know, over the course of the tw range 2010 to 2015, that the, um, the the amount of revenue can vary significantly with it, you know, going up in 2014, 2015. Um, as far as how you participate, um, you just, you basically have to sign up uh, to participate in the market. You have to meet whatever requirements the market has uh, for a device participating in frequency regulation. Uh, then they send you a AGC signal, uh, which you have to follow, uh, and then you're scored on how well you follow that signal. And then that, combined with uh, the market prices, uh, provides you with your revenue. Okay, great. Um, somebody wants to know if you if Sterling participated in the regulation and energy markets simultaneously, or, or whether they were mutually exclusive. But I, my understanding is that Sterling is not participating in regulation. Is that right? That's correct. We're not any regulation at all. Okay. Um, this is an interesting question. We were just discussing this prior to the webinar, actually. So this may take a little explaining. The question is, will the IOU, I think what they mean is, will the, will the uh, ISO reconstitute Sterling's load? Uh, or maybe I, maybe they are right. Will, the, will, will somebody reconstitute Sterling's load as per the ISO tariff? Maybe you can uh, explain what that means, Sean. I guess I, my answer would be I, I don't know if you could because at that time, like, and I, as I explained during the, the, the um, slide, you know, it's not just the batteries. It's batteries, solar, load response, RAM response, 120 meters, I think. All of that goes into the mix. How I decide which one comes out, which one will be available next time, I don't know if that's a firm number, if they could come up with a firm number. Um, 
I, I really don't know the answer. How's that for, for an answer? Can, can you give a little background on, on what load reconstitution is for people who may be sort of wondering what we're talking about here? Load reconstitution would allow them to put those back in, the, what those, those systems that you use to reduce your peak load, they allow you to add those back in as your capacity obligation. Therefore, you'd have to buy repla that replacement power during a peaking period. Um, it's based on the regional network service thing that says they may. Doesn't say they will, doesn't say they shall, it says they may reconstitute your load. Um, it's kind of interesting if they do, they've got to do everyone. So it's kind of how you choose where everyone is. If someone's turning a water heater off, if Sterling's turning batteries off, if someone's got a solar cell that's working, uh, they've got to capture everything in order to do it. So it may be interesting to see how they do all that. Right, but they don't have uh, metric, they can't see those various resources behind your meter. Correct. So so what they're, so I think sort of to simplify this, load reconstitution, basically the way that um, Sterling and other utilities using storage in this way and also commercial uh, customers using storage in this way are, are saving money is basically by uh, lowering their demand during peak regional demand periods. And if you do that, you you thereby get charged less for capacity and transmission costs. And reconstitution would mean that uh, the ISO would then later look at that and say, well, you used something behind your meter to lo artificially lower your demand during that hour. So we're gonna, we're gonna add that back into your cost, right? So, so that's the question is can they or would they do that and so far they have not correct they have not but i think there's nothing you have to look at too also at those points they don't have to turn on another generator if i'm not if i'm not lowering my peak and i'm asking for them to provide additional power they've got to turn on a dirty generator some of the most expensive power comes on during those periods and that require them to go find a dirty generator somewhere to to continue to provide enough capacity by shedding this load, whether it's a demand response program, it's a load control response program, or any way that you can shed peak, whether it's plugging your electric vehicle into the, the grid at that time, which they're talking about in the future, all these avoid turning on expensive and dirty generators. I think that's the goal of everyone. Right, and this so this gets into how this plays into the larger grid, and it's if you are reducing your load during capacity peaks, that tends to flatten those spikes in the regional demand curve and that tends to improve things for everybody because you don't, the less you have to rely on, well, except for the people who run the peaker plants because the, re the less you have to rely on those gas peakers, the cheaper everybody's uh, power is going to be overall. Um, there's another tough question here that uh, I'll throw out. It, somebody wants to know if you're if you're playing in all these markets and dispatching the batteries to provide capacity and and so forth, is it possible that you might be left with a depleted battery in the event of an outage? And then what do you do? I think that comes down to how much you use the battery. And we don't we don't go out and throw you know two megawatts out per hour. We may go over a three hour period and do one point three megawatts per hour to try to capture you know, a wider range. Uh, there's numbers of, you know, if you, if you try one hour, you can get 60% of the time. If you do cover three hours, you can get like 93%, you know. There's percentages based on where we think it falls. And in that graph I showed earlier, it showed the percentage of times it fell within certain hours in certain months. And I think it's, with, with solar, it seems to push that peak out further and further in the day, which makes it a little more predictable, but you still have to spread it out over a couple, three hours. So it's not, you don't have your four hours for one hour. You've got to spread it out, maybe it's 1.3 for three hours or what have you. Okay. Uh, somebody wants to know whether you are uh, using software to optimize and control the energy storage system, um, either controlling charging and discharging or factoring in market signals. Is that being done or is this all still by hand? You know, somebody looks at the looks at the weather and, and reads the report and flips a switch. There's ways of doing that. We have the software and the capabilities of doing that and there's ways of doing that, but it's not really working that way yet because you need to have to set your limits on where you want your um, 
substation or your load to get to, and then at that point some batteries may kick on, but it may not be the peaking period you want it to turn on at. So a lot of it's done by pretty much by hand, and you know by watching. There's too many factors. There was a thunderstorm, which is not in any software, you know, any logarithms anywhere, could mess up everything. So it's kind of still done by hand. So oh. I I want to I want to explore this a little bit more because we have a couple people asking this question, and Dan I I hope you're still on. Is there research uh, going on at the labs or sponsored by or supported by DOE um, or in the private sector that you know of that that would help to make these kinds of decisions more uh, I guess more integrated and automated and less a sort of you know some somebody sitting in a control room somewhere looking at, at uh, you know reports coming in from the from the ISO. Anything that, that that would help to automate this to improve the uh, the efficiencies? The short answer is yes. Um, Sandia, as well as other labs, are, are busy trying to develop these algorithms that would take all this information that Sean has in his head and turn that into an algorithm and into a program that would do it automatically. So, um, and yes, we are working on that. Stay tuned. Okay, so um, I'm gonna I'm just gonna extend this a little bit. I know everybody said they they could stay on for a few minutes beyond the end of the hour. Uh, I invite all the participants to stay on for a few more minutes. We're gonna try to get to a few more of your questions before we end. Um, another question of yeah, go ahead. Go back to your your previous question just real quick. Sure. Just for clarification on those points. It is pre-programmed to operate, you know, predicting where that uh, predictability, where that peak might be. It is pre-programmed, you know, maybe early in the day or midday for that already. So it's not like we're sitting there on the switch in our hand waiting to run it. We do have a pre-programmed when to go on, when to shut off, when to charge, when to discharge, you know. So all that is pre-programmed in there, but it's not, um, you know, it's not getting the information, getting it to run itself is not, not there yet. Okay. So, good, so you're you. doing that. You're doing that like the day of, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of decision making involved in that programming that you're doing the day of, and when you try to do what the human brain does by looking around, and you try to make a code, it gets a little bit more difficult, especially if you try to stack the applications on top of that. So there's where the real challenge is. It's amazing what we do, we don't even know we're doing. Then you try to code that, it gets a little bit more trickier. Okay. Uh, so we will look forward to seeing advances in uh, in automation in this, in this area. Um, another question on the battery system. What's the expected lifespan of the battery system? Now, I, in, in answering this, I you should maybe talk about not only the lifespan, but the but the warranty, the performance guarantee, and whatever other elements go into figuring out the you know the payback and 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 what you expect to get out of the system. We the warranty was set up as a five year degradation, as I said earlier, to, to three megawatts. Um, we expected to go well beyond 10. But the other thing I think that's surprising everybody, even after year one, there's very little degradation to the system at all. And I think that surprised everyone because we don't need to run it as much as they, they anticipated, us, anticipated us doing that because most places run them a lot more than we do. Um, we're just capturing these points in the, in the month and points in the year and then a little bit of arbitrage. So I, I think we don't have a model that we're following yet. We're kind of being the model. So I really don't have a firm answer for you. Okay, well let's let's extend it out beyond this project a little bit, and I'll go to Dan again. Uh, in terms of battery lifespans, I know we've seen different different companies seem to claim different lifespans. What's what's the average, and what's standard in the industry, and what are we looking at in the next ten years or so? So, boy, that's that's all over the map um, because it all depends on the load profile and how you're using the battery. So what what we're actually encouraging when we're doing projects is that we try to nail down 
how the battery is going to be used by providing load profiles uh, in the RFP. And then the, the battery manufacturers who, who are doing a lot of testing and they, they pretty much know how their batteries are going to operate under various circumstances, but they don't really want to share that information. And so what, what you do then is if you give them a load profile and you say you want a guaranteed like um, end of life at certain kilowatt, certain kilowatt hour rating, then they'll, they'll given that profile, they'll provide you that battery or, uh, you know, they'll oversize or a lot of times, uh, you know, knowing that the prices will go down, they'll leave room or they'll just say, you know, listen, we're going to come in at year end and do a swap out. And so, so that's kind of how they're, how they're managing that life expectancy problem. And, and, you know, and as I say, as we go on, the labs are also involved with doing this testing, but it's, it's hard to do accelerated, accelerated life cycle testing on a battery because of the heating problem. So it's just time and use is going to give us the data that we need. Okay. So what I, I think one thing I got out of your answer and Sean's answer is asking what the life expected lifespan is, is of a battery is sort of like asking what the expected lifespan is of anything else. I mean, if you if you had a car that you took really good care of and only drove it to church on Sunday, you expect it to have a longer lifespan than you than a car that you were, uh, you know, racing around, uh, you know, five hours a day every day, right? So um, given that, do you measure it in terms of cycles now rather than time? Can we, and, and what is, and, and so how do you ask, so what's your estimate? You, obviously there's a process here, right? Because you're investing in a system, you have to have some kind of estimate on returns. How do you, how does that, how does, how do you approach that right now for lithium ion? So it's both, there's both a, um, a cycle. So kilowatt hours in, kilowatt hours out, light. And then there's also uh, uh, the, the period of time. In other words, if you only ran it once a year, it's not gonna last 20 years. Uh, and if you ran it every day, it's not gonna last 15 years. What we're shooting for, what we're shooting for is 10, 10 years right now. I, others are shooting for longer, 15, 20. Um, I think that's unrealistic. If you go back to the lead acid days and you would buy a 15 year battery, you would be starting to replace cells uh, probably year one, but by year seven, you would have planned to have uh, replaced every cell in a 15 year warranty lead acid battery. So so we're we're kind of playing with this prediction which and, and I don't really have the answer. Like so I guess that's like kind of the short of it. Um but we are saying 10 years. I mean we're we're thinking that we can get 10 years out of a lithium ion. Yeah. So I had a so Dan uh, you know I'm sorry, Sean, did you want to say something? Just just the thing you know, looking at and while we were building this project, and other times going to the IP review and seeing you know the work that Sandia is doing and, and others, you know, the programs that are out there, I think the battery is going to follow the solar panels. You know, we're, I, projects in 2008 were 180 watts per panel. Now they're 350, 400. I think you're going to see in a few years down the road that these batteries you'll want to change out because the capacity will be double in the same footprint. You know, what I mean, I think that's going to expect, that's what I expect to see down the road in four or five years. Uh, yeah, we've seen the same thing in wind, uh, bigger, correct. bigger, bigger, taller towers, larger blades, bigger, bit more exactly. capacity per, per turbine. Yeah. So, so I don't want to dis disagree with that, but, you know, we are up against the laws of physics with batteries. So, so it, uh, it might not be quite, quite as, um, yeah, we'll see. But but I I'd be a little leery of, of of saying that just because of the laws of physics of batteries. 
Okay, let's get back to this pro the Sterling project. Uh, we, we have a bunch of questions uh, remaining and I'll try to get to a few more uh, specific to this project. So one related to this discussion is, do you have a capacity augmentation plan or agreement with the battery supplier? And then related to that, somebody else wanted to know, is there a decommissioning plan? Uh, the answer to the first question is an energy assurance plan, but that also falls into the warranty. Those these things are covered out for 10 years. We have a five-year built-in warranty in the RFP and an extended warranty from year six through 10. So as far as that goes in the energy assurance, so things are covered for 10 years. Uh, there's a degradation curve that will follow, uh, that we expect to follow, but I think we're going to do better than that, that um, showing right off the bat. And, and is there a decommissioning plan? Decommissioning plan, uh, is, I, right now, we've looked at different alternatives. Um, we, unfortunately for us, right across the street from this is a huge uh, recycling plant. Uh, we're hoping at that time we can carry them across the street. But um, I don't know. That's something we've talked about very little about. So. OK. Um, so. Somebody is asking uh, what role does on-site power generation play? So I guess that refers to the solar. So this is this is a, a battery system that is on a, a line that is connected not only with the uh, police station and dispatch center, which could be supported during an outage, but also with the solar uh, that Sterling had in place before this battery was installed. Uh, and you've mentioned, Sean, that the solar does play a role in things like reducing um, demand during those peak times. Uh, is Are there other roles? Does the solar play a role in other uses of the battery? I mean, um, you know, uh, you're 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 obviously charging from solar and from the grid, but does having the solar there augment any of the other battery applications? I think the way we've looked at this is that solar is becoming more prevalent throughout our our system and throughout you know, New England. And as it does, it's taking that, that demand I spoke about earlier and pushing that further out and further out to you know four or five o'clock, six o'clock when solar is not available. So as solar becomes more prevalent in the early afternoon or morning hours, we're using that solar, that low cost solar, charging the batteries, uh, giving the, the uh, vendors that we have a PPA with, uh, the ITC, the, you know, the credits that they can receive for that to give us low cost power, allowing us to charge the batteries at a reasonable price. And then later on in the day when we need the power, we can then use it then. Okay. Well, uh, so we, we've gone 10 minutes, a little bit over uh, time. I appreciate everybody being willing to extend the webinar. I don't want to go any farther because I know everybody's got other things to do. Uh, but I do want to thank uh, Rayburn, Sean Hamilton, Dan Borneo, and also, again, uh, thank Dr. Zhuk from USDOE for sending his slides and, and um, uh, sorry that he couldn't join us. And uh, Samantha, we have some additional webinars upcoming. They're not uh, specifically STAP webinars, but they may be of interest to the STAP audience. So if you want to very quickly uh, show those and then we'll sign off. Um, and so, as Todd said, all of these webinars are being hosted by the Clean Energy States Alliance. Um, you can read more about all of these on our website, csed.org backslash webinars. Um, and I also want to direct everyone towards some contact info on your screen if you have any follow-up questions that we were not able to get to, or if you're looking for more information or resources, I encourage you to contact Todd or Dan or you can look on our website, uh, the STAP website. Uh, there's a short link to it there. So we hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Bye.